Oke, okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all participants from all over the world. Uh, uh, we would like to start our webinar this afternoon. Uh, uh, our webinar uh, will be in uh, Zoom and YouTube, so uh, uh, you can join either in Zoom and YouTube. Before we start, uh, I would like to call uh, Steve Chen, Deputy Chief of Mission from Taipei Economic Trade Office in Jakarta, to deliver opening remark, please. Uh, Steve Chen, the time is yours. Uh, you still unmute, Steve Chen. <laughs> Uh, I think you're still unmute. <laughs> you still mute. You can unmute. Sorry. Uh, maybe Miss Kai, can you help? <laughs> We can hear you, Steve Chen. Maybe the connection. Is there Steve Chen? <laughs> Sorry. Maybe, okay, you already reconnect again, Steve Chen. I'm very sorry that there's a connection problem. So we are oh, fixing okay. it. Sorry about that. So, it's okay, it's okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna contact it again. And if it's, um, if we couldn't sort it out, it's uh, in one minute, I think we can move on. Okay. okay. Just don't uh, want to let all the participants wait. Okay. So I, I will check it again. Sorry about that. Um, <laughs> it's okay. Uh, so we can start. Uh, maybe Steve Chen can deliver closing remark, yeah, Kai Lim. Okay. Yes, that's okay. Yeah, okay. thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you to all participants for our webinar today. Uh, today we would like to discuss uh, the economic uh, trend uh, post COVID 19 especially in the context of economic integration in ASEAN and East Asia. As we know that. Uh, the impact to the health and the economic uh, sectors uh, in ASEAN countries. Also, uh, the trend of digitalization also related to the, uh, this is change all the uh, economic sectors. Uh, today webinar, we have a, a quite a distinguished speakers. Uh, we have Dr. Aladin. Uh, Dr. Aladin uh, 
previously is uh, he is a uh, deputy secretary general in ASEAN Secretariat uh, for the ASEAN ASEAN Economic uh, uh, Pillar, and also he involved in ASEAN Economic Community Blueprint 2025. And then the second speaker we have uh, Dr. Amalia Adiningar Widian Widya Santi. She is a deputy uh, minister of economic affairs for BAPENAS, uh, National Development Planning Republic of Indonesia. And then for the third speaker, we have Dr. Jayan Menon. Dr. Jayan Menon, uh, he's also a senior economist, uh, now uh, belong to Institute of Southeast Asian Studies uh, in Singapore, Asia Singapore. Previously, he also uh, uh, expert in the Asian Development Bank Institute in Tokyo. And then for the fourth speaker, we have uh, Professor Raldi Hendro Kustur. Uh, he also active in the Coordinating Ministry of Economic Affairs. Besides that, uh, he also senior uh, professor in the School of Environment University of Indonesia. Uh, he also involved in the ASEAN context like a sub-regional cooperation like BMEGA, MTGT. He also alternate, alternate senior officer, official in Master Plan of ASEAN Connectivity. So uh, his PhD from Griffith University, Australia. So the fourth speaker we have um, uh, after uh, Jair Menon and Prof. Aldi, sorry, for the fifth speaker, we have Dr. Uh, Roy Chun Tli. Uh, he is from uh, Taiwan Economic Research Institute. He also a negotiator in the economic in uh, Taiwan in the WTO. Uh, he graduated PhD from uh, Australian National University. And then the last one, uh, Dr. Chin Yung Park. Uh, he, he is a Director of Regional Cooperation Integration Division, Economic Research, Regional Cooperation Department, SNFM Bank, which is just launched the report uh, this, year, this year related to this topic. I think uh, I don't want to uh, uh, waste your time. I would like to start with a call Dr. Aladdin. Rilo to deliver uh, uh, his presentation. Please, Dr. Aldin, the time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you so much and good afternoon. I hope you can hear me well, Pa? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would like to begin by thanking uh, Pa Arisman uh, for inviting me in this seminar on regional economic integration and uh, in the post-pandemic world. Uh, I think uh, the topic that you have chosen for today's webinar is quite timely and appropriate. Since uh, countries around the world, including ASEAN and East Asia are now looking forward to an end of this pandemic. And at the moment also, uh, I think most of the policy discussions in the region are focusing on what countries need to do in order to facilitate the post pandemic recovery. So I think it's very timely that we have this seminar today. My presentation would focus on issue of supply chain resilience and post-pandemic recovery in East Asia. Uh, for me, this is also a very important topic for the region because if you look at East Asia, and including ASEAN, for example, uh, economic growth over the, over the years in this region is very much underpinned by significant expansion in trade and investment in the region, as well as uh, significant participation in global value change. So the way I see it, the post-pandemic recovery would uh, definitely involve the strengthening of supply and trade connectivity in the region. Despite the fragility of the supply chains in the region, as we all know, our research in area suggests that uh, this pandemic has actually uh, did not alter the regional production networks. If we can go to the next slide, please. Uh, based on our research at area, the pandemic, uh, as I mentioned earlier, did not alter the regional production networks and trade patterns in ASEAN and East Asia. And I think the reason for this is the following. One is because uh, the negative supply shocks that were generated by this pandemic at the earlier uh, at the beginning were also overcome early on at, uh, at the early at the as uh, as uh, the pandemic uh, uh, went by during the early months of the pandemic and at the same time we've seen 
Uh, some uh, positive demand shocks, for example, an increase in demand for ICT products that help also facilitate the recovery. Interesting also, interestingly also, when we look at what's happening to the region, looking at this pandemic, our research also shows uh, a more vigorous uh, private sector dynamism in the EAS region during this pandemic. Our research, for example, revealed that uh, companies in the region, uh, those that had been able to uh, reorient their supply chains were able to perform well and have a very and a more positive outlook in their performance. Many uh, companies in the region, including small enterprises, have also uh, benefited from uh, using digital technologies in order to mitigate the impact of this pandemic. While this pandemic, as we all know, has had uh, revealed the vulnerabilities of the supply chains in East Asia region, if we can go to the next slide, I think it has also, in my view, accelerated the need to make the supply chains more resilient and stronger. I think that is one uh, important that reality, reality that, we, that we're seeing right now. And uh, this is very important because when we talk about supply chain resilience, we're actually talking of how the supply chain structures are being supported by more diverse production sources with greater end-to-end -end, uh, visibility in terms of the supplier networks, as well as the ability of the suppliers or the, or the firms to be able to deal with the future shocks. So having this supply chain resilience in our view is very crucial in facilitating the recovery and also deepening the market integration in East Asia. That is why in my view, uh, the post-pandemic recovery or as the post-pandemic world begins to emerge, the need to strengthen supply chain connectivity is no longer an option for countries, but rather it is an imperative for countries in the region to, to pursue in order to ensure that the, the region is able to have a more sustainable future in the coming years. When we talk about supply chain resilience, uh, there are actually different aspects of supply chain resilience. So let me talk about three important aspects of supply chain resilience that in my view are very crucial in terms of deepening market integration and facilitating the post-pandemic recovery. The first aspect of supply chain resilience that is critical in my view is the need to enhance the supply chains for essential materials and goods. As we all know during this pandemic, uh, uh, production structures in East Asia became vulnerable because of the disruption in materials and, and the movement of goods and services in the region because of the pandemic. Therefore, the way you see it, in order to move forward in the post-pandemic world, one important possibility here is for countries in the region to establish or to be able to secure what we call as the critical uh, uh, materials and inputs that uh, East Asian countries use extensively in their production and trade. For example, materials and inputs in the manufacturing sector. Uh, another possibility here, the way I see it, is for uh, the region to establish also the critical uh, uh, supplies and goods, for example, uh, medical supplies and uh, ICT goods that are quite important to facilitate the recovery and in order to ensure that the shortages in goods that we experienced during this pandemic will not happen again and therefore the region will not become vulnerable to this kind of experience. In my view, uh, maintaining these uh, critical uh, supplies and materials and inputs will be very important for the post-pandemic recovery for the simple reason that, would, the, that it would help or enhance the surge capabilities of the suppliers in the region and also it will enable them to mitigate whatever supply chain disruption would occur as a result of the future uh, pandemics or, 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 or crisis. 
I think one very important area here that requires uh, urgent attention in my view is the issue of vaccine uh, production and distribution. If you look at East Asia, for example, uh, countries in the region have started uh, rolling out uh, vaccination programs. But I think the reality is that uh, vaccine uh, insecurity and vaccine inequity appear more very challenging for countries around the region. Therefore, the way I see it in order to address this issue, I think it's about time perhaps for countries in the region to work together to ensure that the critical uh, supplies and goods within the supply chains of vaccine are traded seamlessly in the region. And we can do that by, for example, eliminating bar trade barriers that impact on these uh, essential uh, materials and goods within the, the vaccine supply chain. If you look at what's happening in the region, for example, in ASEAN last year, uh, the economic ministers signed this memorandum of understanding on strengthening non-tariff measures on essential goods. This is an agreement that uh, binds countries not to impose any restrictions on, uh, on, 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 different, uh, on the essential uh, goods being identified by the ministers. The way I see it, perhaps the same initiative can be re uh, replicated in East Asian region by, for example, uh, coming up with an in-depth assessment of supply chains within the greater context of uh, risks and vulnerabilities in the region. And I think that would in, uh, involve, in my view, the ability to identify what are the critical uh, supply chains in the region. And also it requires the ability to identify what are the, the capabilities that are needed to be able to address those critical supply chains? And I think that would include also the ability to identify available supplies okay, in the region to be able to address this uh, supply chain resilience. So that is the first aspect of supply chain resilience that in my view is very critical. The second aspect of supply chain resilience is digitalization. I, I think uh, pa, uh, Arisman uh, also mentioned this earlier during his uh, opening remarks. And we all recognize that during this pandemic, the use of digital technologies has actually become an important lifeline for businesses and households in the region. In the context of the supply chains, I think digitalization is very important. Why? Because it will tend to enhance the visibility at every stage of the supply chains. Uh, at the same time, uh, increasing the ability of the suppliers to respond to potential shocks and, and also to be able to mitigate the impact of these shocks. Similarly, I look at digitalization of the supply chains or digital, uh, digitalizing supply chain operations as important because it becomes an important determinant for supply chain resilience across different industries. For example, in manufacturing and in uh, services sectors, for example. And the way I see it, I think this is made possible because of the use of different digital technologies. For example, uh, by investing in more advanced trace and track technology, I think that would allow greater visibility in the supply chains across the region. Similarly, if you look at big data, the use of big data, I think the use of big data would, would help identify problems within the supply chains. For example, the possible delays in uh, processing of customs uh, uh, documents or even the delay in the delivery of shipment. I think big data will be able to help identify those problems within the supply chains. Similarly, uh, since supply chain documentation in the region is still very much uh, maintained in paper forms, like for example, the bill of lading, uh, I think the use of digital technologies like, uh, for example, blockchain will enable to create uh, a secure and uh, immutable record of transactions as, as well as it would help uh, enhance the integrity of our tra trade transactions. Those are very important in our view when we talk about supply chain connectivity. 
So having said that, uh, I think it's about time, the way I see it, for countries in, in East Asia to intensify efforts on how we can make all these digital solutions support the global value chains. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, digital, digitalization has become very important during this period. And in my view, there are different ways to do that. Okay, One possible action, for example, is to strengthen uh, uh, what we call cooperation on supply chain automation and management. That's one possibility. Another possibility is to strengthen uh, e-commerce, which is very important for, for our region. There's also a need to promote cybersecurity as well as digital innovation or digital investment, sorry. And finally, uh, we also need to focus on how to enhance digital skills and literacy. Those are very important. For example, last year or in, uh, during this pandemic, uh, during this period in ASEAN, I think ASEAN has been able to uh, intensify uh, the uh, uh, cross-border uh, paperless trade in the region as a result of this pandemic. And at the same time, last year, ASEAN countries were able to implement a number of measures. Uh, for example, uh, the use of digital copies in uh, uh, facilitating the release of goods, as well as in, uh, in uh, applications for new licenses in business. So that's how the region has been able to make use of these digital technologies. In fact, the way I see it, the last year within the region, ASEAN was able to enhance trade facilitation because of the use of digital technologies. And therefore, uh, moving forward, I think these digital technologies or the benefits of these uh, digital technologies need to be captured as well when we talk about the future or the post-pandemic recovery. But of course, we also recognize here that any digital transformation will not only benefit from strong policy framework, but I think what's more important here is that whatever policies we have in the region right now need to be supported as well by strong uh, uh, involvement of the markets. Because without the support of the markets of a very strong uh, private sector mechanism, I don't think digital transformation would become successful. The third aspect of supply chain resilience and the third uh, well, uh, 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 element here is the issue of sustainability. I think in my view, it's about time for ASEAN or East Asia in general, for example, to enhance the circularity of the supply chain, also in line with the global agenda on sustainability. Uh, this means, uh, among others, the ability of countries to not only develop or build stronger and more resilient supply chain networks, but I think more than that, countries in the region should be able to balance sustainability, um, efficiency, as well as resilience in, 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 in our production in order to restart production again in the region and also to maximize the intra-regional trade. The way you see it, I think uh, uh, supply chain should not go back to the business as usual model of unsustainable consumption and production. I don't think that's the way forward. Instead, what is needed here is that we need to safeguard the region's uh, natural resources, our social fabric, as well as our economic growth in a more comprehensive way. And in area, we're able to identify a number of measures that we think are crucial for the region to be able to support sustainability moving forward. For example, one uh, possibility here is to strengthen industrial uh, uh, policy that would enable to uh, expand on green businesses and accelerate uh, green innovations. Another possibility here is to facilitate the transition to uh, sustainable energy systems. Because in my view, this is very critical in uh, uh, supporting the various industries in the region, as well as in supporting our economic growth. And finally, I think it's about time for the region also to uh, 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 fasten or, or to, to, to uh, uh, accelerate, sorry, the, the, the transition to the circular economy by uh, initiating some regional discussions on key important issues related to circular economy, such as, for example, how to improve the product design, 
how to increase the efficiency of materials, resources, and energy, and how we can also promote uh, uh, the green procurement. I think these measures are, are very important if the region is to support sustainability. And the way you see it, sustainability will become more critical in the coming years because of what's happening right now because of the pandemic. And I, I understand within ASEAN, there is now an increasing recognition on how to come up with a more comprehensive approach towards sustainability. In fact, they have just uh, 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 finished the, the framework on circular economy in ASEAN within the context of the ASEAN economic community. And I think that goes to show how countries in the region, particularly in ASEAN, are putting a lot of emphasis on uh, sustainability. So in closing, uh, I think uh, we all recognize here that this pandemic won't be the last pandemic, unfortunately. Therefore, I think the way forward is for countries to be able to develop a stronger, more resilient, and more sustainable supply chains. Uh, again, uh, in response to the different economic setbacks during this pandemic, uh, the need for uh, interdependence on trade and investment and supply chain participation, I think this will become more critical in the coming years as part of the post-pandemic recovery. But at the same time, I think we also recognize here that given the complexity of the supply chains, I don't think countries alone will be able to address these problems that we're facing on the supply chain. We need the support of everyone, uh, including the private sector. And I think that is why uh, international cooperation in this context is very important. In this, in this regard, I think that the first step moving forward, as I mentioned earlier, is to make sure that we strengthen the supply and trade connectivity in the region by uh, uh, focusing on the critical uh, uh, supply chains for materials and goods as well as providing digital solutions, as I've mentioned earlier. But beyond the supply chain resilience, I think it's about time for countries to reorient our strategies and policies in the region to make sure that uh, we're able to, uh, uh, able to have our production networks more sustainable in the coming years. And in my view, that would require different uh, 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 elements. One is the need for ASEAN countries and East Asia in, in general to be able to support the multilateral trading system. Uh, we need to have an open, free trade, uh, free, uh, fair uh, multilateral trading system to support our uh, trade integration moving forward. We also need reforms. I think policy reforms are important here. Reforms, for example, on competition, on how to address non-tariff measures, on how to promote connectivity and infrastructure development. I think those reforms are very important. But finally, and finally, I, I want to emphasize here the importance of private sector participation. I don't think without the support of the markets, economic integration in ASEAN or in East Asia will succeed because at the end of the day, it is how the markets are able to respond to these different initiatives in the region that we will have a very successful market integration moving forward, particularly in a post-pandemic world. Uh, this is the end of the, my presentation, and I look forward to your questions later on. Thank you so much, Pa. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Aladin, for a very impressive uh, presentation. Uh, before we move to the next speaker, I would like to call again uh, Steve Chen from Teto. Uh, please, uh, Steve Chen. Uh, Steve Chen. <laughs> uh, you still mute? Okay, we can talk now. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, we can we cannot hear you. Okay. Can you hear me? Ah, yeah. Now we can hear you. Okay. Oh, Good. that's okay. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, My please. apologies that uh, we have some uh, technical issues. It's okay. Uh, it's okay. Accessing uh, the the the, uh, the seminar. <laughs> Okay, it's okay. Uh, sincere, sincere apologies. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Moderator and uh, uh, distinguished speakers and uh, participants, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for the opportunity of uh, uh, cooperating with the Center of uh, Southeast Asian uh, Studies uh, in Jakarta for uh, this uh, seminar. I think uh, this workshop is a, a timely one. It's a timely one. Uh, as you know, that uh, uh, the uh, COVID-19 pandemic has uh, uh, disrupted, uh, disrupted the uh, global uh, business. 
uh, across the world uh, in uh, uh, ASEAN, uh, East Asia areas is also uh, immensely affected. The, uh, the previous speaker uh, touched upon the supply chain, etc. I believe that uh, for the rest of the workshop, uh, we are going to hear the, uh, lots of insights about uh, how uh, we uh, how the area could uh, be uh, uh, resilient uh, in face of the uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, I just want to uh, uh, express uh, the uh, our appreciation uh, to to the to the, uh, the the have the opportunity to work with uh, all the the center as well as the uh, the speakers for this event. Uh, we hope that this is a, a, a good beginning for future cooperation. Uh, so um, just also want to uh, let you know that uh, 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 in Taiwan, we think that the ASEAN areas as, uh, can uh, play an important role in revitalizing uh, the, the economy post COVID-19. So we look forward to the uh, policy recommendation as well from this uh, workshop. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, thank you, uh, Steve Chen. Uh, now, uh... We move to the next speaker, Dr. Amalia from Bapenas. Uh, before, uh, from Dr. Aladdin mentioned about the uh, importance of supply chain resilience. Uh, this also, he mentioned about sustainability and security of supply chains, and the topic of circular economy should be discussed in ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, Ibu Amalia, are you ready, <laughs> Ibu, uh, for presentation? I saw your name. Uh, please, Ibu Amalia, the time is yours. Yeah, silakan, Bu. <laughs> okay. Uh, Terima kasih. Saya boleh share screen ya, sebentar. Ya, 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 sure. Ya. Terima kasih. Silakan, Bu. Sudah terlihat belum ya? Uh, masih uh, jalan, Bu. Belum, Bu. Screen share. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that you can hear my voice. Is that is is yeah. my voice quite clear yeah. enough? Yeah, clear enough, Bu. Please. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you as well for the opportunity that you give that you have given to us to share uh, our view regarding to economic integration in ASEAN and East Asia. So I think this is very much important, as you know that. Uh, 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 post COVID nineteen pandemic, that the trend will change and also the the pattern will also change. So I think uh, Indonesia and uh, countries in the region need to take together this opportunity together. So the thing is that we have to recover together, and we have to recover stronger. Like what we would like to have uh, in G twenty meeting hosted by Indonesia, that that uh, the countries in the world have to work hand in hand and to take any opportunity together because if you only can survive alone and then it will not uh, make any sense and then it will not give us many benefits to the recovery process uh, with that uh, as you know that uh, the recovery in developing asia is uh, still continued even though it's a slightly slower and for the case of Indonesia, we know that the recovery gap is still wide. So that's why uh, I would like to mention that we still have a lot of homework to reduce the recovery gap uh, with the its trajectory of our uh, GDP. So uh, as you know, that uh, the COVID-19 impact on global integration, especially through GVC transmission, that uh, the key to understanding the current state of the regional economy is we need to comprehend the the how the GVC later on after a COVID-19 pandemic will change. Uh, as you know that uh, COVID-19 uh, shocks 
to GVC results in triple hits for the manufacturing sectors. And the first is because there is direct supply disruptions as this disease is focused on the world manufacturing hub. And also the second one, uh, the, the, the second hit is supply chain contagious uh, that amplify the direct supply shocks as manufacturing sectors in less affected nations find it is harder or even more expensive to acquire necessary imported industrial inputs. And what we are now experiencing, including in Indonesia, we also experience the increasing cost of shipment because uh, you know the shipping liners is not as many as before the pandemic uh, before the pandemic uh, uh, time. And also there is like uh, uh, less supply of uh, what do you call it of shipment. Uh, because the number of shippings that goes to other countries is uh, reduced compared to the, the 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 days before the the pandemic, and the third one uh, the third hit is on the demand disruption. This is due to the mac macroeconomic drops uh, and aggregate demand is decreasing. Uh, the purchase delays by the consumers because consumers still really would like to prioritize health other than the other consumption. And also there is like a wait and see uh, process by firms. So it resulted in the investment delay. So what is the ASEAN role in the global economy? As you know that ASEAN straight to the world has increased recently and the share is also increasing. And the, uh, as we know that the top product ASEAN straight related to global value chain is also quite various now, and it is dominated by electrical machinery and also mechanical appliances. Uh, ASEAN is actually the leading factory in the region to produce manufacturing goods. The participation of each ASEAN country in this network has unique features, such as Singapore with its service industry, Thailand with its automotive industry and Philippines with its electronic sectors. ASEAN country success stories also explained by industrial policies or uh, the result of more general key policies, such as openness to trade, macroeconomic stability, investment and technology, inclusive development, and also investment in infrastructure and human capital of ASEAN countries. And the role of labor market policies in innovation is also one of the key drivers of technological progress and productivity growth. So I think with this ASEAN leading factory region and uh, a factory region in producing manufacturing goods, it, it will be like a good, <laughs> a good basis for ASEAN to get growing and to recover stronger after pandemic, uh, co after COVID-19 pandemic. As you know, uh, ASEAN East Asia countries have roles on GVC. Uh, if you look at uh, on the left uh, figure, Asia, China, Vietnam, India, Bangladesh, and South Korea are among the top drivers in textile GVCs. And electronics GVC uh, players are actually China, Korea, Japan. And, and South Korea is the biggest player in the global electronic industries. And it is closely following by, uh, by China and Japan. Meanwhile, Indonesia contributed a relatively significant to the global electronic sectors. Uh, and for automobile, automobile uh, GVC uh, major players, we can see that in Asia, Japan is the leader in the automotive sector, and Indonesia contributes uh, also in, on the rank of sixth in Asia, and uh, following by other big players such as Japan, Thailand, South Korea, China, and India. For, for food, beverage, and tobacco, uh, the major players in GVC is 
uh, Vietnam, Indonesia, China, India, Hong Kong. And I think uh, this could be a good start for uh, Indonesia and uh, countries in this region to how can we make to strengthen the, this global value chain where especially Indonesia also a major player in that global value chain. So with the prospect of uh, somehow global value chain pattern will be uh, probably adjusted. And then I think uh, in Indonesia and countries in the region need to think again, how can we really make it strong, uh, stronger? And then uh, how can we really recover uh, the, and then not disrupt the existing global value chain that have been existed before COVID-19 pandemic. And as you know that current development of ASEAN East Asia trade relations, we can see that uh, East Asia is one of the biggest import source for ASEAN. So, and East Asia is also one of the biggest export market for ASEAN. Uh, the top three ASEAN's imported products uh, from East Asia are electrical, machinery, mach uh, plastic, uh, and also who exported goods from ASEAN to East Asia is mainly dominated by electrical machinery, machinery equipment, and also mineral fuels. So uh, ASEAN is top five biggest exporting countries to East Asia. And then those countries are Singapore, Vietnam, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. Meanwhile, uh, as you know that its counterpart biggest exporters and importers are actually China and Japan. So uh, what is the ASEAN, the ASEAN and East Asia trade opportunities? So I think uh, after pandemic COVID-19, there's a lot of trade opportunities that we can create between ASEAN and East Asia region. And uh, from the analysis that we have uh, based on the ITC export potential map, the products with greatest export potential for both regions are related to manufacturing, labor intensive industries and technology. So for example, that uh, electronic integrated circuits, LED lamps, parts of telephone set and other transmission apparatus, computer data storage unit, and also telephone sets and other uh, uh, voice or image transmission apparatus. Uh, and as you know that smart cards, electronic integrated circuits, LED lamps shows the largest absolute difference between potential and actual export in value terms. So meaning that there is like still a room to increase export as much as 70.3 billion US dollar and 52.4 billion US dollar for Southeast Asia and East Asia respectively. So I think this is the one that we can see there's still a lot of uh, potentials that we can uh, utilize uh, 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 so we can strengthen the recovery through uh, trade opportunities. So this is actually the investment trend, but the thing is that how ASEAN countries need to respond to the pandemic. We know that COVID-19 has impacted economy in ASEAN and East Asia. Uh, we, we experience uh, GDP growth uh, negatively uh, and, and the economy is contracted. Uh, but again, we can see that China uh, economy now is really bouncing back and rebound strongly uh, to, the, to, to the rate of growth as much as 8.2% in 2021. Uh, so when there is the robust global demand for electronic products and semiconductors, this will continue to benefit companies that are deeply integrated into East Asia's electronic supply chain, including the Republic of Korea and Taiwan province of China. Uh, but the thing is that uh, this recovery process uh, during 2022 and, and beyond 
And I think this could be utilized uh, quite well by Indonesia and ASEAN countries. So in this regard that the market opportunities that, that are happen uh, in the near future, it can be filled uh, to uh, help support the recovery of Indonesian economy and ASEAN countries. Uh, but the things that we still homework, that non-tariff measures, uh, we can see that non-tariff measures in other countries is increasing during the pandemic. Uh, if you see from the data that we have, that uh, uh, it seems to us that non-tariff measures are less transparent and more difficult to monitor. And if you see that the spike of new interventions by ASEAN countries is actually uh, uh, on the sectors such as iron and steel, automobiles, machinery, agro-food, and textiles. Uh, so in this regard, and this is our uh, homework together, and how can later on post-COVID-19 pandemic, we can reduce these non-tariff measures together. Because if we, we keep these tariff measures implemented by any country in this region, and then it will be like a bottleneck for us to recover faster uh, post-COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, this is what uh, the data that we have from WTO and also from Yamashita and Fukasaku uh, that NTMs in, w, uh, the, in WTO dispute settlements are quite a lot now. Uh, and also anti-dumping and countervailing measures will likely continue to raise concerning over the potential negative effect on merchandise trade flows in East Asia. And some, however, some businesses optimize, uh, optimistic that domestic supply and demand will respond to the COVID-19 situation. And then, uh, as you know, that there is also uh, uh, a potential that after COVID-19, there is like an optimistic from the business side that after COVID-19 pandemic, that the situation will be better than before. Uh, as you know, that also there is like a trend that there has been an improvement in digital adop adoption uh, on G GVC. Uh, and then I think this also uh, a good opportunity, but on, on the other hand, also it is like a challenge for Indonesia that if you would like to be able to compete with the global in the global market, then Indonesia also need to accelerate the digital adoption in our uh, uh, economic activities, including in our uh, global value chain uh, network. So, uh, what is the policy implication that we have to tackle? Policy responses globally that countries across the world have implemented a broad range of policy responses in an effort to facilitate economic recovery from the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, such as uh, they, they apply tax incentive and for improving diversification, they also uh, provide, explore additional production capacity and markets. And uh, some countries also apply trade facilitation and digital, digitalization, as well as investment to support supply chain. And uh, what we need to do is that uh, we, would we would like to say that we have to strengthen ASEAN trade integration and improve investment climate. If we would like to really take the opportunity uh, after COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, long-term policy implication is that we can expect from RCEP benefits uh, such because we know that RCEP is actually consisting of a lot of countries uh, as a 
as a uh, as a member of R RCEP member and then from this RCEP we can try to strengthen regional value chain with simply we simplified the production strategy by considering we can consider more material source options low labor cost options cheaper raw material prices and proximity of the production site to the market so we can expect from RCEP that uh, there should be an expansion and deepening of regional value chain uh, that have been formed under Asian plus one FTAs. And also we can expect that RCEP can reduce the production cost uh, that happened before, uh, before the RCEP uh, signed. So uh, I would like to say that uh, we also need to consider that the recovery process uh, in the near future is not only recovery, but we also need to pursue on green recovery and towards zero net zero emission 2060. And uh, there have been a lot of concern in Indonesia and ASEAN as well to really uh, apply and implement green economy. Like Indonesia also, we already directed our policy to green economy, such as we would like to reduce the, we would like to support the low carbon development. And also we would like to really facilitate the green industry and green investment. So I think this could be also one way that we can recover better after uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, with that, I will stop there. And again, I would like to highlight again that uh, Indonesia and countries in the region need to work hand in hand and work together so we can, we can recover stronger together. And also the recovery process need uh, not only a, a conventional recovery, but also we need to pursue the green recovery so we can bring uh, and build forward better and we can pursue to a more sustainable growth and sustainable development in the future. Thank you and I will stop there and have a good day. Yeah, thank you Dr. Amalia for your presentation. Uh, yeah, we agree that uh, we have to recover together and uh, ASEAN and East Asia country can play important role in terms of uh, how uh, digital adaptation in the global supply chains and uh, Dr. Amalia also mentioned the importance on green economy. Uh, so I think uh, we will discuss later. Uh, I would like to go to the next speaker, Dr. Jayan Menon from Institute Southeast Asian Studies, Singapore. Please, Dr. Jayan Menon, the time is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pa Arisman. And uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be back uh, at this uh, CSEAS um, uh, webinar once again. So uh, let me just try and get uh, my screen up here to share. Um, please let me know if you cannot see it, it clearly. Um, let's try my yeah, hand. we can yeah. see it clearly. Okay. <laughs> oh, great, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's actually just change the setting, I think, again. Uh, yeah. Okay, so um, uh, what I want to do uh, in the next 15 minutes or so uh, is to uh, talk about a few things. Uh, of course, the theme is uh, uh, on uh, ASEAN and trends in the post-COVID era, especially in economic integration. So I'll start off by very quickly talking about the COVID situation in ASEAN, uh, the imp economic impacts and the outlook for recovery. Um, here, I want to also, you know, look at how the Delta outbreak is uh, affecting uh, prospects for recovery. Uh, but then I want to move on to some policy issues about post-pandemic uh, new normal uh, relating to, uh, firstly, opening borders, and secondly, dealing with a number of um, uh, issues uh, of uh, uh, disruption. Uh, that we will have to uh, contend with uh, adjustment, adjusting to it uh, because of various di the digital 
uh, disruptions and the demographic changes taking place. Right, then I'll conclude. So uh, I think you all know and you've heard already today about how for Southeast Asia, at least, the pandemic is not ending, but it's peaking. Uh, you know, we're having the worst outbreaks in this region. Um, you can see that's also affecting uh, mortality rates, which are going up quite sharply. Malaysia is the worst, uh, in fact, but you can also see that uh, things are quite bad uh, also in uh, Indonesia and, uh, you know, uh, in um, uh, Thailand, not too bad, but uh, I guess... Um, uh, all countries, it has gone up uh, quite sharply only recently. Uh, and vaccination rates also have varied across the region. Uh, Singapore has done uh, uh, better than uh, the rest. Malaysia is quickly catching up. Uh, uh, Cambodia has been the surprise. We've done uh, extremely well um, yeah, for a poor, small country. Of course, it's the smaller countries that find it easier to have a higher vaccination rate because of the smaller populations. Um, but of course, um, you know, the larger countries uh, are still struggling to get their rates up. And Indonesia also is one of them that has a low uh, vaccination rate, uh, just like uh, the Philippines uh, and also Vietnam. So a lot of catch up required there. Okay, so uh, despite all of that, I think recovery is underway. Uh, this is the chart of quarterly data for countries that report them in ASEAN. Um, and you can see uh, these are year on year numbers. And you can see that, um, you know, in the second quarter, there have been, uh, you know, sharp rebounds in all countries. But this is coming off the, the trough of, uh, the second quarter of 2020. So you need to bear that in mind, right? So the bounce is bigger because the, the bigger the fall. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, you know, uh, Delta broke out and yet we saw uh, that growth was still quite strong. Um, most of the impact actually might still be in train and could show up uh, in the next quarter of Delta. Uh, but I think um, it's fair to conclude uh, that so far, at least, it seems that Delta will dampen, but it will not derail the economic recovery in ASEAN or East Asia. Um, and uh, the data so far tends to support that. Uh, the bottom that was hit in the second quarter of last year is unlikely to be tested. Uh, we won't go back there. In fact, the only issue is how fast and how much uh, how quickly and how much the recovery will be uh, going forward. Uh, ADB's uh, latest forecast were just released yesterday. And even there, uh, for developing Asia as a whole, it was just a small drop uh, from uh, 7.4 to 7.1. Um, in uh, ASEAN, it was a much slightly bigger drop uh, from 4.4 to 3.1 but still nowhere near derailing uh, the recovery. Now, I think there's uh, uh, a number of reasons why the link between the pandemic um, as measured by infection rates and the economy as measured by growth uh, in GDP is weakening. So uh, this link is weakening, I think, for three main reasons. Uh, the first is that, um, the government response this time around has been less draconian and uh, more targeted. So the general lockdowns that we saw in most countries in ASEAN, except Indonesia, uh, in around May last year, uh, were not introduced, except for Malaysia. Uh, most of them were targeted um, and uh, not uh, uh, that long either. Uh, not the, full, uh, the two months that we saw the first time around. Also, I think firms are learning to better adapt to lockdowns. Uh, they're learning by doing, and they're able to uh, maneuver around the restrictions uh, better. And so uh, the impacts on uh, the economy or the out on output 
is reduced. Um, for instance, if you look at the Google mobility data uh, for Malaysia, which had a lockdown uh, in May, as well as just a few months ago, uh, the two lockdowns, uh, two or full lockdowns, uh, mobility in retail fell by 80% uh, last time, the first time in uh, May 2020, but only about 50% uh, the second time around. So there's clearly, uh, you know, uh, less of an impact on the economy from the same type of restrictions, right? And finally, of course, the uh, stimulus measures by government has not only continued, but actually increased in almost all cases. Uh, so this, is continue, this has allowed uh, uh, countries to uh, you know, uh, mitigate a lot of the impacts of uh, the worst outbreaks that they are experiencing uh, recently or even right now for many countries with Delta. Okay, so all of these reasons lead me to believe that uh, uh, Delta won't derail the recovery, but it will dampen it. Uh, but we should start uh, looking at ways in which we can uh, consolidate the recovery going forward. And I think an important step in that direction has to involve the opening of borders. Now, one thing that we have uh, uh, seen is that um, even with the worst outbreaks uh, recently, uh, countries have started slowly reducing restrictions on domestic movements. In fact, it was quite bizarre, for instance, in the Philippines, where you know, they reported the highest daily infection rates at the same time that they announced reductions in uh, domestic restrictions on movement. And this has been happening in many countries, um, in Malaysia as well today, there's more restrictions being reduced domestically, uh, despite you know, uh, having the highest per capita infection rate in the world. Um, and uh, I think there's uh, lockdown fatigue setting in, but it's all domestic restrictions. The borders have remained largely shut. And this doesn't make any sense, uh, any economic sense. Uh, in fact, um, uh, for many countries, uh, they don't allow anyone in except for very select groups one and a half years after the pandemic, uh, while domestic restrictions are you know, easing continuously. Um, I think the reason for this is they feel that um, they want to prevent the entry of new variants. Um, well, the evidence shows us that this does not work, right? And you cannot stop the new variants from coming in through border restrictions. The best example of that is Australia and New Zealand that almost completely sealed off their borders, right? Even Australian citizens can't, are finding it difficult to get back into Australia, but yet they have every variant uh, and now uh, spreading uh, in the community quite significantly in New South Wales and uh, in Victoria. Uh, so the ultimate safeguard is improved domestic protocols, not border restrictions. That's been proven. Because by the time you impose these travel bans, it's too late. Um, you know, the, um, by the time the new variant shows up in large numbers of infections, it's already spread everywhere, right? So, uh, unless you completely close your borders to everyone and remain autarkic, which is not sustainable, you cannot keep out the new variants. So we should start looking at ways of reducing the gap between domestic and border restrictions. I'm not saying open up completely, uh, but I am saying that the gap is too big and there are ways in which you can um, uh, improve economic outcomes without raising health risks uh, by carefully opening up uh, the border in a calibrated way. So one, um, 
way forward uh, would be to start with the unilateral actions like uh, micro herd immunity or the so-called sandbox approach, which uh, Thailand in particular has uh, been implementing in Phuket and Koh Samui, and now looking at other uh, pockets, but other countries also um, in, in Vietnam and maybe even uh, the Philippines might try this. Uh, and this is one way of starting, I think, which is uh, quite sensible. And then you can move towards, uh, you know, uh, trying to get reciprocity to travel bubbles. And finally, uh, you can look at multilateralizing uh, these travel bubbles into more general opening to countries that have either uh, high vaccination rates or low infection rates or both. Uh, in fact, both would be best. But we have to start reducing the big gap between uh, domestic movement and cross-border movements. It doesn't make economic sense and it's not really helping uh, with the health outcomes either. Okay, and we can see how these restrictions uh, on the border have simply remained in place. Okay, um, now um, because of time, let me go quickly to the next few things. We know that uh, a number of uh, other mega trends are taking place, including the pandemic uh, giving a push towards the digital economy. Uh, and now this is having both uh, positive and negative effects. Uh, it is increasing inequality both within and between countries. Um, and uh, this is also operating through the skills premium uh, where, you know, higher skilled workers get a huge uh, premium paid to them, increasing wage inequality. And also there's a lot of disruption to labor markets, right? And this is the major concern. Uh, the job loss, uh, you know, associated with automation and robotics will affect um, the low skilled or repetitive tasks that can be automated uh, initially but it's also spreading to other sectors as well. And um, uh, these sorts of adjustment costs uh, in the short run, uh, in a post-pandemic uh, new normal, will be very high and will require mitigation through greater factor mobility. Uh, and this is greater labor and capital and data mobility. Um, on top of uh, that, of course, we have uh, this divergent demographic trends in the region, which will add to disruption and increase the need for greater factor mobility. Um, ASEAN is aging, but not all of ASEAN is aging at the same rate. Um, the CLM countries, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, are much younger populations, have much younger populations than the rest of Asia, right? And also East Asia, for instance, Japan, China, Korea, is aging very rapidly, while India, a very populous country, has a young population. So um, the younger populations tend to be in the poorer countries, while aging populations are both in rich and poor countries, right? Uh, but you can see here already how increasing factor mobility can help reduce uh, adjustment costs in both aging and young uh, societies, as well as rich and poor countries. Um, uh, not just aging, as I said, but also the disruption uh, caused by the digital revolution. So all these factors suggest that we need to increase uh, labor, capital, technology, data mobility going forward. But uh, while we need to do these things, uh, the pandemic is reinforcing un uh, trends that are, that's undermining globalization. Uh, so this existed 
before the pandemic, but um, um, it's been reinforced by the pandemic. These are, uh, you know, uh, sentiments of nationalism and protectionism, and they're reappearing now in various forms, new ways, new names, uh, but they're the same thing. They're just protectionism in a new disguise. Uh, and reshoring is one. Before, uh, during the G, after the GFC, it was called rebalancing, and sometimes it's even called resilience. Uh, we heard from uh, Dr. Rillo earlier about how supply chain resilience needs to be improved, and I uh, agree with all of that. But sometimes uh, uh, it can be abused, and resilience can become a sort of excuse. Uh, to promote protectionism, and most recently, a, uh, an excuse to move China out of supply chains uh, because of the geopolitical uh, uh, issues involved, or this great power rivalry, as it's called. So we have to be wary of uh, new protectionism or all protectionism with new names uh, that are uh, re-emerging. So. Um, uh, we have to try and increase labor and capital mobility at a time where the, um, uh, the forces are working against it. Okay, so I'm going to try and speed up a bit now um, to try and wrap up. So uh, if we can't increase factor mobility because of the new anti-globalization push, then we should at least try and ensure increased trade. And we should uh, continue supporting regional agreements to do that, uh, as well as the WTO. Uh, regional agreements like AEC, RCEP, and CPTPP, and the WTO must play a bigger role uh, because trade, increased trade, can produce a lot of the similar outcomes to increased factor mobility. Not the same, but similar. Uh, for instance, even if factors cannot move across borders, trade can help equalize factor prices, right? So wages of labor and rentals on capital can be equalized over time just through trade and even without factors moving across borders. Okay, so that's it. Uh, let me conclude in just one minute, uh, Arisman, if you allow me. Yeah, uh, please. Yeah. So the pandemic is peaking, not ending, but recovery is underway. But it's mixed and uncertain uh, because of the um, Delta outbreak. Now, to ensure that it is a sustainable recovery, we have to start planning to open borders now uh, as vaccination rates are rising. Uh, we need to increase vaccination rates more quickly but the planning should start now to open borders and it can start with unilateral actions uh, on the micro level to bilateral and then finally multilateral. Uh, now the pandemic is increasing the move towards a digital economy and this can actually have both positive and negative impacts. Uh, I focus on the negative ones because I think they will dominate in the short run. So, um, uh, to deal with this short-run adjustment costs, we need to increase factor mobility, um, labor and capital and data mobility. Uh, but we, to do that, we first have to overcome the backlash against globalization that's rising all around the world. Uh, so um, you know, this is going to be a big challenge, the new normal. Uh, keeping borders open uh, or, you know, opening borders soon or, you know, allowing uh, uh, restrictions to be reduced relatively soon uh, at the border. Um, and if we cannot get labor and capital moving again, we must at least try and keep trade uh, growing because it can try and do some of the work that factor mobility will do. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your attention and uh, look forward to your questions yeah. later. And back to you, uh, for Arisman. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Jayan Menon. Uh, now, uh, 
yeah, uh, we move to the next speaker. Uh, Dr. Jaya Menon mentioned about digital disruption and also need better adaptability, adaptability by firm and as well as how important the regional agreement like IEC, RCEP play important role on the post-pandemic. I would like to call the next speakers, uh, Professor Raldi from University of Indonesia. Please, Professor Raldi, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Is it clear, uh, uh, my voice? Yeah, yeah clear. Please uh, share the okay. 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 Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is an honor for me to be here uh, to be invited by the CCF and also to distinguish speakers. And I think I will share about my experience concerning the senior officials for sub economic uh, regional uh, corporations during my time, about uh, 10 years in there. And then I would like to share about uh, how the millennials uh, what is it, uh, res resolve the problems uh, towards the pandemic situations, for especially from the uh, micro level. level. So uh, let me take uh, I, I put the topics so, as such. And then uh, next slide, please, Mas. Yeah. OK. Uh, so uh, I'd like to quote the data of gross domestic product of ASEAN. As we know that Indonesia is still uh, in the last year is still high because, uh, and then followed by uh, Thailand and others. And knowing situations of the pandemic, of course, uh, sluggish downturn uh, from all economic growth, as mentioned by Dr. Amalia. Uh, uh, I want to talk about more about that. The next slide, please. As we have here, the corporations like uh, ASEAN Economic Co Community and APEC, part of uh, the focus today. Uh, as we probably aware that uh, Asia, Asia Pacific countries are also facing similar issues in the form of limited economic capacity the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. This current conditions calls for interdependence and cooperation among countries. And, and also establish a group of to leverage economic cooperation with, uh, such as AEC and APEC. And uh, perhaps we, I would like to share more about the sub-economic region. Next slide, please. Economic regional cooperation for ASEAN. At least uh, there are three sub economic regional cooperations uh, within ASEAN. The first one is GMS. I didn't put here because it's involved more uh, bigger than ASEAN. There is in five out of six countries involved uh, are part of ASEAN, but the other one is China. And the second one is uh, IMTGT, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand Group Triangle, on the left side of Indonesia, then, uh, I mean, west part of Indonesia. And uh, the second one is BIMP, Iaga, Brunei, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Philippines, East ASEAN, East ASEAN Growth Area. In fact, so these Asian countries have uh, established sub economic regional cooperations. We, we try to uh, share more about this. Excuse me. I think, uh, next slide. Indonesian economic and pandemic, however, uh, pandemic has uh, also brought deep contractions. In this context, the government of Indonesia attempts to pursue the economic recovery. Unfortunately, the government has to resort to mobility restrictions measured, as mentioned by Dr. Jayan concerning the closed border and also we have to open the border, but depending on the situations is step by step would be open as long as the pandemic would be coming to endemic later, perhaps. And also uh, the government should uh, create all jobs uh, and also with the limitations and all brings uh, impact towards small scale businesses. 
and think uh, we face it uh, to the rest of the part uh, of cities, especially in the suburb. And we can see the the next slide, please. I'm trying to focus on the circular economy. As mentioned, it's uh, in the beginning by Dr. Aladdin that uh, considering the supply chains. We, can, we cannot go any further without uh, having some kind of uh, field survey on site, such as circular economy. Uh, but despite the fact that uh, sustainable business model uh, like circular uh, economy can support small scale business, such as small medium enterprises. So what is circular economy? A circular economy is a sustainable approach that consider and business activities and, and the impact related to sorry, sorry i sorry I, I i lost my site here uh, according to alan perhaps uh, first is reducing waste uh, and also uh, and pollution so how to realize that this leads to the second track principle, which is keeping products and materials in use. Example of this is recycled materials. And finally, the last principle is regenerate natural system. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, we turn to one of the points of reducing waste uh, pollution. Waste happens uh, to be a major issue in the country of Indonesia, as well as uh, the rest of the ASEAN countries. As you can see in this table. Uh, next slide, please. Waste issue. This is uh, happened to be raising a pandemic. And, it, and this is unseparated from work from home movement which turns out to be resulted from mobility restrictions to curb infections. And these wastes are not only produced in household during uh, work from home, but also healthcare facilities. The latter is referred as medical waste or hazardous waste produced due to treatment of patients infected by COVID-19. So uh, a lot of, uh, waste coming, uh, especially in the suburb, because uh, most of them staying at home, working at home. Next slide. Concerning waste issues, it turns out to be a huge opportunity for silver economy in Indonesia. The NDP also stated about uh, 45 billion by 2030, accompanied with lower emissions and waste should Indonesia fully adopt the zero waste circular economy approach. The circular economy in Indonesia is also potential due to the increasing amount of national issues, including the already mentioned garbage and various waste, which bring opportunities for not only circular economy, support of SMSE, sorry, SMEs, but also partnerships supported by technology. As also mentioned by the Dr. Aladdin concerning the supply chain. Next slide. Circular economy as quoted by Minister of Development Planning Boards. The implementation of circular economy is expected to be one of the strategic policies and breakthroughs in rebuilding a more resilient Indonesia after the COVID-19 pandemic with the creation of green jobs and through increased efficiency of resource utilization. It is also mentioned by Dr. Amalia. Next slide. Waste and circular economy. Regarding waste, waste treatment efforts are currently concentrated in suburb asset, I mentioned before, especially healthcare facilities. They are mostly due to household and medical waste produced in respective areas. All of those may become opportunity for some easy get involved 
in this field. So uh, investment com might comes and induce more generating to the economic situations, especially for transport services. Next slide, please. Technology and partnership. A side of issues as an opportunity for silver and economy, Indonesia is also supported by growing online service use like Grab and currently Gojek. So the online service use is expected to push digital economic companies to expand market that is eliminating national boundaries. At the same time, ASEAN countries, including Indonesia, are looking for cooperations. ASEAN plus three, for example, and perhaps Tito would like to join with the IMTGT as well as BIMP EAGA. It shows that ASEAN nations to cooperate with Japan, China, South Korea, as well as uh, Taiwan, and to cooperate with uh, uh, the situations of uh, economic uh, pandemic. As online-based service and technology intensifies, this leads to the creations of line among nations. Next slide. Technology and partnership. The cooperation among ASEAN countries and East Asian economies, supported by online services use and technological advancement, then push sub regional economic partnership. In turn, this would push small medium enterprises domiciling in the sub region areas to develop. As such, the results is economic recovery as well as stronger integrations among Southeast Asian countries, as well as East ASEAN countries. I take a, a case study and what happened in Jakarta metropolitan areas, Jabodetabek. Next slide, please. One of the firms that utilize technology is solving these issues is Cactus. Take the Cactus case. They use technology uh, they developed by the millennials. They use the technologies uh, in form of big data as a solution to address waste problems, such as such a problem in categorizing waste to be collected and processed. By using big data, Cactus can categorize this waste and compile and uh, uh, compiled and stratified into the, what is it, uh, separating, uh, sorting the waste, and finally, uh, final uh, disposal of the waste. So how uses the services provided by Cactus? Fortunately, Cactus has an app, which I'll show you in the further slide. Next slide. As you can see, this is, this is the apps of Cactus. Next slide. This is how Cactus works. Categorized waste is later con con converted into the data by assigning a uniqueness code. The service later changes collections and sorting of waste based on this unique code. In my conclusions, the bottom line is that issues amid pandemic creates opportunity for circular economics in the future that benefits to all parties involved, including societies and in the environment. So as knowing the situation, this would later create sub-regional integration and cooperations even wider and bigger, which in turn benefit for all. Thank you very much. I look forward to have positive discussions. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Aldi, uh, for impressive presentation. Uh, we go to the next uh, speaker. Uh, you're already in the room, Dr. Roy. Okay. Yeah, please, yes. Dr. Roy, uh, you, the time is yours for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you very much, Director Arisman. I, I, I hope you hear me well. Yeah. Yeah, we can okay. hear you. Clear. Thank you. Clearly. <laughs> uh, give me two seconds to uh, share my slides. 
So, so okay. are yes. we in a full screen? Okay, it's, it's working yes. now. Okay, we can see oh, your thank, Okay, thank you very much uh, to allow me to speak at the, the second half of the uh, seminar. So I can already hear many uh, amazing and very uh, meaningful remarks already. Um, um, I would like to focus my presentation on a more uh, more specific area of issues that uh, many countries in, in this part of the world, especially uh, Taiwan, Korea, Japan, who are uh, you know participating deeply in the global supply uh, chain, uh, uh, there there were a lot of uh, debates and 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 and, and also uh, discussions on the future of the global supply chain. And I think ASEAN is also aware that uh, because of the supply chain reform, ASEAN is it is it is actually creating an uh, increasing number of especially opportunities for ASEAN countries to deepen uh, uh, our participation in the global supply chain. And the reform direction of the global supply chain also have a direct implication for the regional uh, regional uh, integration process. So that will be my. Uh, topic of presentation for the next 10 to 15 minutes. So uh, are you seeing now the next slide? Yeah, sure. Okay, thank you. Well, let me start with uh, some of the uh, kind of snapshots of what we are in the year 2021. But the process I'm going to share with you started actually four, five, six years back. Now, uh, at the center of global supply chain and regional integration, we are facing at least several uh, in increasingly permanent and structural changes that might have direct implication for the global supply chain and the regional integration uh, process. First of all is, of course, the, the changing uh, relationship between US and China. Now, um, uh, ever since China uh, entered the WTO in the year 2000, uh, there is a surge of U.S. investment and trade and technology and education, other areas of cooperation. So, actually, U.S. is considering China uh, not necessarily to the level of strategic, strategic partner, but they are considering China as a very important and, and uh, uh, the prospect is very positive uh, uh, in terms of uh, cooperation, especially in the economic areas. So it is definitely a robust uh, a partner in that sense. But since uh, in, in the final years of President, uh, former President Obama, and of course the four years of uh, pres President uh, Trump's administration, change has been uh, changing very dramatically. Uh, uh, when President Biden took office in January uh, uh, last year, there were different uh, debates about how Biden administration is going to trade China. But uh, since the publication of the interim national security guidelines back in March this year, and uh, increasingly, we are seeing um, even from the Congress that from the legislative side, uh, uh, a, a new, a very new and more clearly defined relationship with, uh, uh, with China that are surfacing. So now we are seeing the turn of, uh, to describe China as a strategic competitor, and increasingly as a strategic rival. So the U.S. is pursuing a strategic competition with China, uh, pursuing a longer term objective of leadership and, and other uh, technology leadership, economic leadership in other areas. So, uh, and also uh, the European Union is also uh, is redefining its uh, basic position with China. So now China is also uh, not only a strategic pattern, but also a strategic competitor and a strategic rival uh, to the European Union. So that's US China. And international, in, in terms of international economy, we are increasingly seeing the call and the demand for green economy. We're, uh, we're seeing a very high level of demand for uh, resilience of supply chain, 
And increasingly, we are seeing the debates and arguments for the increasing uh, to increase the level of economic security. And green economy resilience has been already discussed by this very distinguished panel. So I won't spend time on that. And, but I think we can summarize what the US and, and U, EU has been pursuing in the last 18 months as a kind of open strategic autonomy. I actually borrowed this official term uh, from the EU Commission's latest report on uh, EU uh, industrial policy, which was published just uh, recently in, in May this year. So the term open, openness is of course one of the keywords here, but more importantly, uh, EU and the US are, are now uh, focused on strategic autonomy. So they are pursuing a restructuring of the globe, of the supply chain to ensure that for critical goods and critical sectors, EU and the US is able to maintain its strategic autonomy by reducing reliance on imports or by re reducing its reliance on competitors. Now for Asia Pacific, uh, supply chain reconfiguration become a very popular uh, uh, topic, not only among uh, private sector, but also among uh, policy makers. Uh, there were a lot of uh, uh, arguments about whether there's a pressure for uh, for countries to side taking sides between choosing between the US and China. Although every, none of us would like to see that from happening. And also what's the uh, implication of China joining the CPTPP, which was announced a week ago. And just for your information, Taiwan officially announced our official application to join the CPTPP. CPTPP uh, this morning. So I have been busy receiving calls on, uh, on, on how we, 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 we digest uh, this development. So CPTPP become a very popular bandwagon uh, in terms of Asia Pacific regional integration process. Now for Taiwan and other uh, uh, economies in this area, we have definitely an elevated relationship with the US and Japan and other countries, but also uh, we're trying to maintain a balanced relationship with China. I, I put it here awkward relationship. So, you know, politically there were a lot of rhetorics and, 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 and conflicts, but economically China remained to be number one trading partner to Taiwan and everybody else, right? So an investment remained very robust and China remained to be one of the most attractive markets for mo most of us. So. It's a kind of awkward uh, relationship, and there were uh, a lot of uncertainties of the supply chain reform. So this is what we are seeing in the year 2021, and probably in the next foreseeable future, most of these factors will remain in place and having an impact on our decision making for both the private and the, uh, the, the public sectors. So. If we want to uh, summarize some of the driving forces for global supply chain uh, reform, we are seeing uh, 10 years ago, there were calls in the US and EU for job creations to, to, uh, and also to create uh, a better uh, competitiveness by recreating or reshoring manufacturing base back to the EU and the US. And also the pandemic, uh, and, the, and the demand for resilience accelerated the process of reshoring, especially in the United States and beyond. And also the new stance towards China is, is also uh, playing a very important uh, role in the acceleration process of the supply uh, chain uh, uh, reform process. Now, I would like to also to highlight the importance of the, uh, the, consider the re fresh consideration of economic security. This is a very nice diagram prepared by Ron Corporation last year in assessing the multiple dimensions of critical, of uh, uh, economic security issues, um, critical sectors uh, uh, face. Uh, for example, um, one of the key risk factors here are supplier dependency. And Taiwan, for example, is facing a great challenge because of the supplier dependency on semiconductors, right? So the US and the EU and Japan are reviewing their supply system, uh, in particular of the supply of the semiconductor uh, sector, because they are aware 
there, that there is an over dependency of suppliers. And Taiwan being uh, one of the supply, main suppliers, we are actually facing great pressure to diversify and also to relocate uh, as a way to address this supplier dependency uh, security uh, uh, concerns. So uh, con different economies the country have different situation consideration, but let's look at the US example, sorry, the US as example. Uh, back in July uh, this uh, year, the US formally published its first version of critical supply chain review report. So now, unsurprisingly, uh, the report concludes that for the four priority sectors, which are semiconductors, critical medicine, medical products, critical materials, minerals, and uh, advanced batteries, the conclusion is that uh, there were dependency issues, there were vulnerability issues, there were uh, uh, subject to disruption issues. So the recommendation for the U.S. supply chain review uh, report is that you, the U.S. should enhance security through, first of all, partial ratio, that is bring back the capacity of manufacturing. Also to uh, deepen the level of diversification and acceleration of resilience. Uh, cooperation with alliance uh, and trusted partners and, and, and accelerate and you know uh, divert diverting more resources into uh, r d and the human capital uh, investment the u are taking is taking similar approach back in may this year they, they published the updated uh, in new industry strategy strategy report uh, as part of the report it in the EU Commission indicates that there are at least 137 products that you are, are, they consider EU is highly dependent on imports. And out of which 34 of these 137 products are especially vulnerable uh, due to the fact there's a low level of uh, uh, further diversification possibility and also a low level of substitution with uh, EU uh, production. So again, there's a toolbox recommendation, reassuring import substitution, uh, again, intensify R&D and other uh, undertakings. So uh, what we are seeing now is that uh, in the U uh, Euro Europe, uh, sorry, the US case, uh, they are pushing for two uh, reform tracks. The first uh, reform track is to address the issue of geographical concentration. So semiconductor being one of the best examples, 92% of the logical many, uh, chips uh, uh, in the US market are manufact manufactured in Taiwan, for example. And, and you know, not, not just in Taiwan, but in just two cities in Taiwan, which is one is Taiping to and the other is Tainan. So to the US eyes, it is, you know, this geographical concentration reflects very high level of economic security. So they want to diversify by inviting TSMC, which is the main uh, contract manufacturer of uh, uh, semiconductor chips to relocate in, in the US. They also want to encourage more uh, diversified resources of supply. The other uh, direction of reform is com competitor concentration. So the US concludes that for uh, advanced better, uh, for example, um, China is, is uh, counting for uh, too much of the global supply of advanced battery. And China being considered as a major or as a strategic competitor, you, the United States feel this is, uh, there's a risk element here that the, U the US would like to uh, uh, bring in some reform to change that situation. So, Following these two lines of reform uh, considerations, there are several implications for regional integration. First of all, reshoring is definitely uh, creating uh, pressures for many companies and many countries, economies uh, to, uh, to face a lot of uh, several uh, uh, years of uncertainty in, in, in the next couple of years. But our observation is that reshoring will be partial and limited because the cost of manufacturing is simply too high in the US and the EU as well. So there will be reshoring of advanced technology segment of a supply chain, but not necessarily the entire 
supply chain. So the mass market supply chain is likely to uh, uh, to remain in the, its current form, but the pressure to diversify and the pressure to relocate will be growing. So stakeholders like Taiwan are actually looking for relocating partners. And ASEAN has been considered one of the number one priorities in this process. Secondly, cross-border investment technology transfer will become the new uh, 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 growth uh, uh, momentum and that creates new opportunities. So we have to probably understand you know, the way the importance of uh, facilitation for investment and facilitation for technology transport become increasingly important. The next one will be the big, the impact of the very big concept of like-minded and trusted partners, which has been a very popular term that's been used to describe uh, the reform uh, process. But you know, nobody really have a concrete definition of like-minded and trusted. So uh, that creates distortion and uncertainties in the market and also for regional integration. And finally, steep integration issues. Integration issues that probably not fully covered by uh, agreements such as ASA and CPTPP. I'm talking here about human capacity cooperation. I'm talking about the training of STEAM, science, technology, engineering, engineering and mathematics uh, uh, personnel. I'm talking about uh, cross-border financial arrangements for especially small and medium enterprises. And finally, I'm talking about digital transformation. So uh, in addition to traditional regional integration undertakings, I think we also, especially for ASEAN and other partners to consider those deep, deeper integration uh, issues, uh, issues that might become very important in the process of uh, the, globe, the great uh, global supply chain reform. And, and I will stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Roy. Now we move to the uh, last speaker, uh, Dr. Park from Asian Development Bank. Uh, I believe Dr. Park already here. Okay. Uh, please, Dr. Park, the time is yours now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much um, also for the organizer having uh, invited me to speak about regional cooperation and integration in um, Asia. Well, um, my presentation will be based largely on our latest um, the publication called uh, Asia Economic Integration Report, which was launched in um, February 2021. Well, next slide, please. Uh. Over the past several decades, Asia's regional integration have made a significant progress, uh, driven mostly by trade and uh, FDI, financial integration, people's mobility uh, and tourism. But the pandemic impact has been quite significant. As you can see that the regional uh, integration in Asia has been largely driven by uh, the trade, FDI, and also the tourism. Next slide, please. In 2017, uh, ADB launched a composite index that measures the uh, regional cooperation and integration in Asia Pacific. Um, this composite index um, comprehensively captured the dynamics of uh, different dimensions that might uh, also underlie the regional cooperation integration in Asia Pacific, namely trade and investment and the regional value chain, um, in, uh, the infrastructure connectivity, financial integration, monetary financial integration, people's mobility and institutional social integration. As you can see, the elements that have made significant contribution to regional cooperation in Asia Pacific comprises the trade and investment, the regional value chain and infrastructure and connectivity, as well as people's mobility. And over the past several decades uh, in uh, where the Archie uh, has been computed based on the data availability, uh, you can see a um, uh, gradual increase in the regional cooperation and integration. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Nevertheless, the regional integration in Asia, um, the, in terms of uh, their degrees uh, by different uh, sub-regions and, and uh, different dimensions are very quite significantly. And you can see uh, the RCI index actually uh, shows almost as high as uh, um, the EU, uh, but um, the uh, dimension of uh, institutional and social um, falls a bit uh, behind for Asia. And uh, also in uh, across different sub-regions, the um, IHA shows the uh, highest uh, degree of regional cooperation, uh, mostly in uh, Southeast Asian countries, um, most uh, generally at least this uh, ASEAN economies and also East Asia. So you, uh, it also, the, uh, this one also um, kind of uh, shows that uh, in uh, regional cooperation integration in East Asia and Southeast Asia are quite uh, advanced compared to other sub-regions in Asia Pacific. Next slide, please. As there have been uh, the, also the evidence that shows that trade supply chain investment, uh, the main pillars for regional cooperation integration in uh, Asia, especially for uh, East and Southeast Asia, uh, we'll uh, go over a bit more on uh, trade supply chain investment for Asia. Next slide, please. COVID-19 and stringent containment measures severely disrupted Asia's uh, cross-border trade flows and activities in 2020. But, uh, there, uh, but you can see that the, oops, sorry, I got something. Uh, but you can see uh, the, uh, after the, uh, after um, some disruptions, there have been uh, recovery in um, the in terms of uh, the exports, imports, and uh, the logistics figures. And ADB estimated uh, the uh, developing Asia contracted in 2020 for the first time in six decades. The economy and trade are gradual. Uh, uh, expected to um, rebound uh, this year, although the COVID-19 impact have been uh, quite uh, still significant and the, um, the outlook has been dampened due to insert the resurgent COVID cases and uh, delayed um, COVID rollout, the delayed COVID vaccine rollouts, okay? Next slide, please. FDI performance um, in 2020, uh, 2020 uh, have uh, shown the validity of uh, this uh, um, the uh, slowdown and the recovery uh, also in uh, FDI inflows. Um, uh, the greenfield investment remain um, still a bit uh, weak. But the MNA um, activities have returned uh, to um, a quite a, a robust uh, recovery. And um, the cross border MNA deals have uh, shown a significant um, the, uh, recovery in uh, late uh, 2020 already. Next slide, please. During the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, many Asian economies have leveraged better infrastructure and technology to allow uh, faster and cheaper domestic and cross-border connections. Uh, new technologies, digitalization, and services trade can help connect global and regional economies uh, even uh, closer and provide new channels of uh, global linkages. This ongoing pandemic also highlights the contribution of digital services in allowing the economic activities such as uh, e-health, online education, 
telework and online meetings, despite um, the mobility restrictions and then uh, also uh, quite uh, restrictive uh, containment measures. The COVID-19 pandemic also provides an opportunity for greater global and regional cooperation, specifically in areas of uh, containing and uh, containing the spread of the virus, uh, strengthening global and regional value chains, and thirdly, increasing resilience to natural hazards and then health risks. Next slide, please. We have seen a significant changes now in uh, global and uh, regional trade landscape. The post pandemic trade landscape is expected to uh, be characterized by three main driving forces. Uh, first, the momentum of globalization will likely uh, be revisited by uh, many economies with uh, belief globalization will continue to progress, but they, uh, this trend may uh, take a different shape. And secondly, supply chains are expected to undergo a significant reconfiguration to minimize the risks from disruptions. It could take the form of regionalization, a reshoring of a value chain, and uh, diversification of supply chains. And thirdly, the pandemic has accelerated digitalization of economies. Digitalization, digital transformation uh, will continue post-pandemic and cross-border trade transactions um, uh, that uh, will uh, become increasingly dependent on uh, digital tools and the real-time data. Um, therefore, um, the uh, Therefore, they, uh, there should be more emphasis on uh, the use of the digital technology to facilitate trade uh, by also helping um, the uh, removal of uh, behind border bottlenecks and then uh, non-tariff measures. Next slide, please. Non-tariff measures have been on the rise while the barriers to trade facilitation continue to persist. And uh, the number of non-tariff measures imposed on Asia increased significantly over the past few years, even before the pandemic. In the area, especially in the areas of anti-dumping, uh, this is uh, shown in the dark blue in the middle, and the safeguard measures, sanitary and phytosanitary measures. This is a top blue uh, in the uh, left-hand uh, panel. And the technical barriers to trade, this is a dark green, uh, also significant among others. On trade facilitation front, um, UN ASCAP's 2019 global survey shows the significant progress that has been made toward streamlining trade procedures in the region, but implementation of uh, the world um, or the WTO World Trade Organization's uh, trade facilitation agreement have been varying across groups of uh, measures. cross border paperless trade measures such as electronic exchange of certificates of origin uh, or of sanitary and phytosanitary certificates have been initiated in less than 40% of the economies in uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, this is uh, also done only at, uh, on a pilot basis. The low average implementation rates for small and medium-sized enterprises, women-owned um, firms, and trade finance facilitation also show a very uh, few countries have customized the trade facilitation measures for these uh, um, the less uh, um, the uh, the, this, these more um, the um, the less advantaged uh, groups of the economy. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yes. <laughs> um, 
So embracing the evolution of digital trade will be crucial for the recovery of uh, the regional economy from pandemic, as well as uh, achieving um, more resilient and inclusive growth uh, in the post COVID era. Well, on the left hand side, um, we can see that the digital channels for sell, uh, the sales have uh, been increasingly important uh, for uh, B2B countries that have adopted uh, to now uh, the digital technology to changing uh, cons uh, uh, to, uh, to attract and then uh, tail uh, and tailor uh, make the uh, uh, the uh, their products and services uh, that fit for the customer uh, preferences. One will also notice a decline in in-person interactions toward a more remote model of uh, sales after the breakout of COVID-19. The remote sales, which can be done through the phone or the internet, is uh, seem to be a new norm these uh, days, um, uh, which is uh, uh, also uh, similarly um, shown in the online uh, increase in the online support e-commerce. And um, two, there are five key policy reform areas to unlock the potential of uh, digital trade. First is to invest in digital infrastructure and connectivity to broaden physical access to mobile and internet networks. And secondly, we need to invest in logistics and in delivery infrastructure, including the application of digital solutions in customs and border procedures. And third, governments need to intensify regional efforts to modernize and harmonize regulations on illicit activities such as cyber crimes, money laundering, and then tax evasion, especially with increasing cross-border digital transactions. It is critically important to strengthen international tax cooperation and harmonization to plug loopholes and properly capture profits generated by the uh, digital economy. And fourth, we need to enhance digitally enable financial services and e-payment options to facilitate digital transactions and support the digital economy. And lastly, but not uh, least importantly, policymakers should institute legal, regulatory, and institutional reforms to improve the ecosystem for digital economy. A flexible approach should be made when setting policies uh, and uh, regulations, and they need to work together with the private sector to uh, build open and innovative ecosystems for platform businesses. All of these should be done while ensuring adequate legislation or regulations for data privacy, uh, consumer protection, and uh, cyber security. Next slide, please. In this uh, context, um, RCEP uh, they recently signed uh, as uh, uh, one of the um, largest uh, the free trade uh, the agreement uh, for the region uh, does provide a strong potential uh, to promote and deepen um, regional integration, especially in uh, Asia. Um, the Asia Pacific region. The RCEP. Um, uh, comprises the uh, members of uh, ASEAN and Australia, Japan, New Zealand, and the People's Republic of China and the uh, Republic of uh, Korea. And this uh, really represents the uh, largest free trade agreement in history involving about 30% uh, of global GDP and of about the same proportion of the world population. It also combines the existing bilateral agreements between ASEAN economies and its uh, five major trading partners. The RCEP um, can benefit not only Asia, but also the rest of the world. And RCEP uh, will be an important stepping stone toward an in open integrated economic system across the Asia Pacific. RCEP uh, could further promote trade in the region by strengthening regional production networks through greater harmonization of uh, regulations and policies among members. So um, the, we have uh, 
try to estimate some of the uh, economic impacts uh, of RCEP uh, for uh, RCEP economies as well as uh, the uh, you know, rest of the uh, region, rest of the uh, region in uh, Asia Pacific and the world. So um, next slide, please. Let me, uh, next slide, please. So let me uh, share um, uh, some of the okay. uh, modeling methodologies and then also the, uh, um, the estimated results based on this uh, CGE model. We, uh, this uh, uh, model uh, has been um, encompassing the 19 different sectors and 29 different uh, regions uh, using the uh, CGE, computerized general equilibrium model. And we included uh, three different uh, policy scenarios. First is uh, um, the based on the phase one agreement uh, after the uh, prolonged US conflict. And then second is the CPTPP, the signing of the CPTPP. Uh, we included the uh, innovations. Uh, there are four different innovations, the baselines, projections looking ahead to 2020-30, and the detailed analysis of uh, existing and future trade agreements. And uh, we follow uh, the Melitz model, uh, where the firms have a different uh, productivity. And uh, so this is a heterogeneity uh, in uh, productivity uh, of the firms in the model. And then uh, finally, uh, we also use the uh, investment uh, effects. Uh, uh, the, uh, and then the details of uh, these uh, modeling, uh, the uh, modeling uh, features are also reported uh, in uh, the uh, paper uh, on the, uh, on the uh, with the link uh, that you can see here. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay. So um, based on the, this model, uh, this is the summary of uh, uh, the you know, policy effects on the global economy. Um, in uh, the, we have estimated the cumulative uh, economic and then uh, employment impact of uh, uh, the policies. First is the uh, US uh, PRC trade effect and a uh, trade uh, conflict. And then this actually uh, shows a reduction of a global income. Uh, by uh, more than um, the 50 billion uh, US dollars per year until 2020, uh, 2030. And uh, also there's the uh, biggest uh, losses um, that uh, incurred to uh, the PRC and US and uh, the US, uh, the China trade conflict also reduces the world exports by 1 trillion US dollars. Um, and on, uh, on this scenario, the RCEP scenario is uh, additional. Uh, and when we in introduce RCEP scenario on top of a US-China uh, trade conflict, it uh, increases uh, US, uh, the global income and uh, the gains are mostly coming from uh, the uh, removal of uh, non-trade uh, the non-tariff barriers, and then uh, then after that is the tariffs, and then the, um, the rule of origins, and uh, there is a significant uh, in there's a benefit of significant uh, integration across uh, plus three economies: uh, China, uh, Japan, and Korea, uh, especially in advanced manufacturing. And when we uh, see the uh, when we uh, have uh, the uh, the effects combined effects of a CPTPP and then an RCEP, uh, together they offset uh, uh, the uh, effects of uh, trade war on global uh, income, although they don't uh, fully offset the negative effects for uh, China and US, the, the, uh, the negative effects are um, uh, offset to a certain degree uh, for uh, the rest of our members, and it they, it also leads to even larger global gains if uh, China and then U.S. are uh, 
the um, uh, part of the uh, CPTPP, and it uh, it leads to greater large gains if uh, uh, five other regional partners also participate in the CPTPP. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. So this uh, uh, shows a bit more details of uh, the economic uh, impacts of uh, these uh, three different scenarios. First, the U.S. trade war and then uh, U.S.-China trade war and uh, the uh, two additional scenarios. Uh, first, the, the CPTPP and then RCEP. As you can see, uh, for RCEP economies, um, the income have been uh, the, the uh, income have been uh, the uh, negative uh, for uh, 456 uh, the billion dollars uh, that uh, um, the uh, you know, subsequently um, on the offset uh, by the introduction of CPTPP and uh, RCEP. And uh, uh, also, the in terms of uh, exports, uh, you can see that also the RCEP uh, economies have been uh, negatively affected by the U.S.-China trade uh, conflict. Uh, but uh, the CPTPP and RCEP again uh, subsequently uh, reduce and offset those uh, uh, losses uh, from the trade war. Next slide, please. And um, this uh, also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, shows the uh, composition of uh, um, the sources for the income and trade effects of RCEP. And um, the largest uh, uh, sources of uh, these uh, income and trade effects are coming from the NTB, both the goods and services, uh, followed by um, the tariffs and then uh, also the uh, uh, the rule of origin harmonization. Next slide, please. We have also uh, the uh, investigated the impact of uh, these uh, three different uh, policy scenarios, US-China trade conflict, uh, CPTPP, and RCEP on uh, wages and employment. Trade war depresses wages for China and Hong Kong China. Um, most RCEP economies are uh, much affected uh, as they depend uh, to some degree on uh, the China uh, for uh, the manufacturing uh, production, but also compete on uh, in uh, global markets. Uh, the only uh, if exception is uh, Vietnam. It seems uh, the uh, Vietnam does uh, experience uh, gain. Um, um, in uh, wages. And CPTPP and RCEP increases a real skill wages by 1.3% and 1.1% respectively. And similar effects are also shown for unskilled wages. Effects are highest on the highly trade uh, dependent economies like uh, Vietnam. Um, on employment, trade war reduces employment by 3 million globally, but it's offset by increases of 1.5 million and 2.6 million due to CPTPP and RCEP respectively. Uh, China loses uh, 4.8 million jobs due to trade war, but it uh, the regains of 159,000 uh, uh, due to CPTPP, uh, but 1.4 million due to uh, RCEP. And Vietnam is the biggest uh, winner in uh, employment. It gains 1.8 million jobs from uh, the three uh, scenarios subsequently uh, introduced. And Malaysia, Japan, and New Zealand have a smaller but positive gains from uh, scenarios. So you can see that uh, you know the um, um, the uh, introduction of uh, RCEP uh, does have uh, does bring uh, quite uh, substantial uh, gains uh, for the RCEP members and also uh, having um, positive if, uh, impact on uh, employment. Next slide, please. So 
So um, this shows uh, by uh, different uh, these uh, effects on the employment by uh, uh, different countries, and then uh, in the Malay, in the Vietnam, and then Malaysia uh, does uh, show uh, you know fairly. Uh, uh, strong gains in uh, employment in both skilled and then unskilled workforce. Uh, and uh, many uh, ASEAN economies also uh, gain positively uh, from uh, the uh, from this uh, the regional trade agreement, especially RCEP. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, Asia's regional integration um, continued to make progress with varying degrees of integration across different dimensions and then sub-regions. COVID-19 threatens to reverse progress obtained by open trade investment and people's mobility, but digitalization can help the region uh, recover and then reconnect. Asia is expected to maintain strong trade recovery post pandemic, but reconfiguration of uh, the global supply chain will pose challenges. Um, we need to uh, emphasize that uh, uh, the reduction in uh, non-tariff measures and then uh, also the accelerization in uh, digitalization uh, will uh, need to be, um, uh, will need to continue to improve trade logistics and then efficiency. And this will help uh, um, the promote digital trade in goods and services. And finally, the C to seize the potential of digital transformation, the region needs to improve the digital readiness and uh, also continue to um, narrow uh, digital divide. Okay. Um, okay. This uh, uh, wraps up uh, my um, presentation. I'll be very happy to entertain any questions if you have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Park. Uh, yeah, looks like uh, we ran out of the time, uh, but uh, I would like to give uh, for all speakers like a uh, Two or three minutes uh, closing remarks. <laughs> uh, so we can start with Dr. Aladdin from area. Uh, so the question is uh, the opportunity post pandemic related to the uh, COVID-19. Uh, all the speaker mentioned about digital economy and then uh, also uh, to recover together mentioned by Dr. Amelia. So I think uh, we can start with Dr. Aladdin, and maybe you have a closing remark or closing thoughts, please, Dr. Okay. Aladdin. And thank you, Parisman. Uh, it's uh, very uh, engaging to listen to all the presentations. Uh, they're very uh, uh, insightful. And I think for me, uh, moving forward, particularly when we talk about the post-pandemic recovery, this is a good opportunity for the rest of the world, including ASEAN and East Asia, to 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 uh, look at to what extent economic integration is going to work. And the current pandemic obviously uh, highlighted a number of issues, a number of challenges and opportunities. And I think it's about time for ASEAN in particular to grab those opportunities and to answer the different challenges. Obviously the two important uh, challenges are on digitalization and sustainability. And I hope that uh, Moving forward, especially as the ASEAN economic community is going to be reviewed after 2025, I think ASEAN right now is in the process of uh, developing a new vision for ASEAN in terms of ASEAN economic integration. I hope that this current pandemic will uh, provide uh, useful lessons for ASEAN to uh, restart thinking to what extent we can make economic integration more useful. Okay. And to what extent uh, economic integration can really make impact to the region. And, uh, and for me, uh, the issues on sustainability would definitely uh, uh, be an important area to look at. Currently, ASEAN has been able to address this issue, but unfortunately, there is no comprehensive approach towards sustainability. The ASEAN circular economy framework that was developed this year is a good start, but I think the, the crux of the matter is to what extent this framework is going to be implemented. So I'm hoping that that would be uh, incorporated into the new uh, AEC blueprint that will be developed uh, after 2025. 
Similarly, the issue on digitalization, which has been discussed uh, in all the presentations, is definitely a game changer for, for ASEAN. Uh, this uh, digitalization has been discussed even before the, the COVID-19 pandemic. But I think the pandemic has highlighted the urgency okay, for the region to really, to really look at what sort of issues we need to emphasize. And I think Sin Yang in her presentation also highlighted some of the issues, for example, issues on, on data privacy, on cybersecurity. These are issues that need to be highlighted aside from the critical issues of infrastructure. So again, for me, uh, the way forward for, for this pandemic is to make sure that there are important lessons learned and at the same time that those lessons are really implemented on the ground and put into more concrete uh, uh, activities. Thank you, Pak. Uh, thank you, Dr. Aladin. Uh, now, uh, because Ibu Amalia have a meeting with the Minister of Bapenas, uh, Dr. Jayan Menon, maybe you have a closing. Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Pak Arisman. Yeah, so I guess uh, let me just sort of highlight the key points that I tried to make uh, earlier on. Uh, I think um, you know, as we uh, deal with this uh, Delta outbreak at the moment, especially in Southeast Asia, uh, it looks like um, you know, uh, it will dampen growth, but it won't derail the recovery. Uh, and uh, there are a number of reasons for that. I won't go through it again. But uh, I think to ensure that we are firmly on the path to recovery, we have to start planning uh, to open borders. Uh, we have seen how uh, domestic uh, mobility restrictions have been coming down, uh, even in countries with uh, the highest, uh, uh, the biggest outbreaks. Uh, you know, uh, lockdown fatigue has resulted in uh, easing of uh, domestic mobility restrictions. But borders in this part of the world have still remained largely closed, unlike North America and Europe. Of course, this has a lot to do with vaccination rates, but they are catching up now, finally, a long way to go, but we have to start planning to open borders. And I think we can move uh, from the micro herd immunity mm -hmm. to travel bubbles, and then look at more multilateral openings. But we might have to start with unilateral actions. Yes. Uh, countries should see it in their interest to open up. Um, in the post-pandemic new normal, I think uh, the push towards uh, a digital economy uh, will be mostly disruptive. Uh, there will be some positive elements, uh, but uh, in the short run, uh, it will be mostly the disruption to the labor market that we'll have to deal with, especially amongst the less mobile, uh, low-skilled workers. Uh, to deal with that, I think we need to keep borders open. We need to increase factor mobility uh, at a time where anti-globalization sentiments are on the rise uh, because of the pandemic, actually. So uh, the pandemic has seen a shift in the anti-globalization focus from trade globalization to factor mobility. And that's the big concern, I think, in the post-pandemic new normal, uh, to make sure that you know, all the restrictions on labor movement don't remain longer than warranted, and all these calls for reshoring don't end up uh, you know, disintegrating the world, uh, you know, this reversal of FDI flows to their home countries, which is exactly what reshoring uh, is all about. So to avoid a period of disintegration rather than integration, we have to uh, overcome the rising tide of anti-globalization uh, that the pandemic has induced. Uh, and um, if we can't uh, keep uh, factor mobility uh, uh, you know, increasing, we must at least keep trade growing uh, because trade can compensate for the lack of factor mobility to some extent. And I think that's where we will have to focus if we can't get uh, labor and capital and data mobility back to where they were before the pandemic. So that's the big challenge that I see. So let me stop there. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Hermenon. Uh, now, Prof. Raudi, do you have any closing hey, well, statement? Thank, <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Pak Arisman. Um, I believe I fully agree with uh, the Dr. Jayan as, as well as uh, Dr. Aladdin. Well, uh, knowing the situations of the pandemic that uh, and then postpone pandemic later, but we have to wait till the pandemic to be endemic. So we step by step to to make some you know open border like uh, Dr. Jayan mentioned. And but on the other hand, the uh, capacity building would be very important. So having uh, such a training of trainers, for example, so to make uh, uh, keeping up with the situations of digital technology, as well as the digital economy later. So it would be very uh, useful for, uh, for all. That is all investment towards the, especially for Southeast Asian countries. Uh, that would be very encouraging in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Raldi. Uh, I also agree that we need a capacity building in terms of uh, digital uh, technology. Maybe uh, Taiwan can play that role. Yeah? Maybe Dr. Roy, uh, can you share with us how yes, Taiwan can course. play <laughs> this role in Asia, please? You know, uh, in terms of digital transformation, as a kind of concluding summary, uh, we were joking here in Taiwan that uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic is better than 10 chief information officer in terms of accelerating uh, <laughs> the speed of digital transformation, yeah. right? So okay. we want to reward COVID-19 for that. Um, yes, uh, we were actually all still uh, exploring uh, the, the digital transformation, uh, 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 especially in terms of capacity for small and medium enterprises. You know, small and medium enterprises, and, and of course, micro uh, miss me, uh, especially constrained by their understanding the resources about uh, the way uh, digital transformation is, is about. Uh, so uh, I think COVID-19 makes a lot of these business owners understand that it is not a luxury, it's actually a, a basic need for to accelerate the process. Uh, but the key is uh, uh, many of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, we, we saw a lot of temporal uh, measures to combat the war against COVID, but this is what this is not the first uh, pandemic, and and this won't be the last one. And many of the uh, measures should be here uh, to stay and uh, to become a permanent measure, and that's a very important step to share with uh, you. That uh, I think the awareness of businesses about the permanent. Uh, benefit of digital, digital transformation and also the permanent, permanent benefit of uh, resilience and diversification. It's not only for COVID-19, it's for the next pandemic and beyond. So uh, I think just to share with you, we were happy to help to facilitate, even though we are also learning process, but the, the very important step, uh, you don't need high technology, you need mindset changing. And that's probably something that we can all do together. Thank you. Yeah, uh, good to hear, Dr. Roy. Uh, so we focus how to empower SME in terms of uh, capacity building, like mentioned also by Prof. Raldi. And uh, Taiwan have that kind of experience. Uh, uh, if we know that uh, also SME in Taiwan can uh, be a best practice. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, we can learn from each other. Maybe from uh, the last speaker, uh, Dr. Park, uh, from the Asian Development Bank pr perspective, uh, what your uh, views on this context, uh, please, uh, Dr. Park. Um, well, uh, the many have uh, already noted that uh, you know the rise of digital transformation as a strong um, the driver for future growth. But I would also like to highlight that uh, uh, the, in, there has been um, uh, the, uh, there has been uh, disproportionately larger impact of COVID on uh, the societies and the countries less fortunate people, and uh, uh, the during the pandemic period, it uh, was also uh, quite unfortunate that. Uh, um, the people who have not had 
uh, effective uh, and affordable access to uh, digital technology and then also uh, not being able to join the ride for that uh, digital uh, transformation are suffering even more. So going forward, if uh, you know, as we believe that the uh, digital transformation is uh, one of the greatest the tool to be able to achieve a more resilient and sustainable growth and then development uh, back in the region. We should make sure that uh, you know, access to uh, these uh, uh, economic opportunities are also equitably distributed by supporting these uh, um, underprivileged people uh, you know, with the targeted assistance. Thank you, Dr. Park. So yeah, uh, I don't want to make a conclusion, but uh, I take note from all speakers. Uh, there's a keyword like sustainability, circular economy, digital economy, as well as how we work together uh, in the global supply chain. Uh, and I believe, uh, I, I also agree that uh, Asian countries can work together uh, to win this competition in the uh, trade war among the big countries in the region Asia and China. So how uh, ASEAN and East Asia country uh, in the same time we compete each other, but in the same time we cooperate. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's quite uh, impressive, uh, all the speakers. Uh, thank you. Before we finish this uh, seminar, can we take a picture together with the participant? Uh, please, uh, participant, Thanks. you can open the camera. Uh, it's very rare opportunity <laughs> to take a picture with Dr. Park, Dr. Aladdin. They are very busy. <laughs> Please. Uh, yeah, the organizer already take a pic uh, picture. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you again to all the distinguished speakers, uh, all the participants from all over the world. Uh, uh, we also record the YouTube. Uh, please feel free to watch again uh, in the evening. Thank you so much. Uh, stay safe and healthy. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care. Thank bye. you, Dr. Park, Dr. Aladi, Dr. Jayam, and Prof. Raldi, as thank well, you. Dr. Thank you, uh, Bye. <laughs>